Okay, I think it is now time to to open the session. I see that we still we still have uh, people joining and will be joining in the next minutes. Just wanted to say again a warm welcome to everyone who joined us today, wherever you might may be in the world. I know some of you have made the effort maybe to stay up late or wake up early for, for this session. So I wanted to say thank you for, for your efforts. My name is Anka Damaro. I am the head of programs at the Luke Hoffman Institute, and I am joined today by an extraordinary team of people that have worked very, very hard to bring us all here today um, to provide more details about our recently launched innovation challenge. So throughout this session, you will interact with our talented project team um, formed of Leonie Brown, our project manager, and uh, Maria Ines Hernandez, who's our diversity, inclusivity, and research coordinator. Um, Andrew Thompson, admin and logistics support. Sudai Yer, the communication consultant that has uh, done a fantastic job. And Anaik um, Antonios Blanc, who's the research and innovation coordinator for the Luke Hoffman Institute. Before I introduce the, the speakers uh, and we dive into information about this uh, challenge, I want to go through some of the quick housekeeping aspects. I see that we still have people joining. So welcome to, to those just that are have just joined us. We are just going through quick housekeeping aspects. So this session is going to be recorded to be made available to those that weren't able to join us today. And we plan to put it online in the next few days. Please use the chat to send your LinkedIn profile, get connected with people and network. In the first 30 minutes, we will be providing information about the innovation challenge, introducing the partner organization, getting into the, the details of the challenge. So what the challenge is seeking, who can apply the timeline, the process and so on. And I will then relay questions from the audience. So throughout this talk, please use the chat to, to ask questions. We have a team that will select some of them and I will relay to, to our speakers. If there are any unanswered questions by the end of the sessions, then we will add them to the FAQ page on our application portal. My colleagues are going to, to share in the chat box, the FAQ where you can already see maybe some of the questions that you have uh, answered. So I just want to reiterate that you can add questions to the chat box at any point in time and the team will try to reply as we move through the session at the end of the session and in the FAQ if they get, if they're not unanswered by the end of the session. So this innovation challenge is part of the Future of Conservation NGOs initiative being led by the Luke Hoffman Institute. And this idea emerged actually on an autumn's day over a conversation with the former director of the Institute when we asked ourselves, what does conservation need right now to deal with the 21st century problems? And what is the future of conservation NGOs? And since then, we've, we've embarked on a process of, of deep listening and we engage with hundreds of voices around the globe to understand what are the type of issues that people working in and with conservation are, are facing. And we heard from people all over the, the world saying that NGOs continue to be a bedrock for societies that experience major political instability, all the way to others questioning a world where NGOs don't exist anymore and could new structures better equipped to deal with uh, complex issues could, could emerge. So our role has really been to create a safe space for people to have an open and frank conversation about how we can reimagine, redesign the future of conservation work to help build a more just, a more inclusive, a regenerative future. And the Luke Hoffman Institute has partnered with uh, IUCN, Commission on Environmental, Economic and Social Policy, 
ensure it by UCNSS, and the impact hub to drive innovation and support solutions that proactively address the rooted, rooted issues that we are facing in conservation in non-governmental organizations. And we will be providing more, more details on these deep rooted issues shortly. But I think first, uh, before I start talking too much about the initiative, it's time I turn to our speakers. Uh, these are fantastic people that uh, have been with us on this journey uh, from the beginning. So up first, we have Martin Kalungu Banda. Welcome, Martin. Martin is a consultant in uh, organization and leadership development. He's a facilitator of innovation and change. He's a trainer, he's a coach, an author, an entrepreneur who has co-funded at least eight businesses in the last 10 years. And he has been involved in the Future of Conservation and Geos initiative from the beginning, giving us valuable input during, particularly in the first phase of the, of the project. He's also one of the co-authors of the analysis report that was recently published that looked at explore, exploring possible future of conservation NGOs. And it was published in March, 2022. You might have seen it already. My colleagues are going to share a link for those that haven't seen it. And he's here to give us his orbital perspectives on the need for innovation for transformational change within conservation and geo sector and the much needed motivation to drive radical solutions. So thank you for joining us, Martin. We also have with us Anayali Ramos. Welcome, Anayali, representing our partner organization, IUC and CESP. And I wouldn't even know where to start. Anna wears many hats, as she always says. Um, she has worked with indigenous peoples and local communities on a range of issues including environmental governance, sustainable livelihoods, agroecology, and human rights. And her background is in social and environmental governance, and her passion is in providing indigenous people and local communities with the support that is needed for them to continue to care for their territories and ways of life in their own, on their own terms. She's the international Policy Coordinator for ICCA Consortium and Deputy Chair for the IUCN Commission on Environment, Economic and Social Policy. So thank you for joining us, Anne. And finally, we have Bruno Lacey. Welcome, Bruno. He is here as a representative from Impact Hub. He's also a social entrepreneur and has co-funded impact initiatives such as up farming, urban growth, and the climate change, the game, projects that were aimed at delivering positive social and environmental change. He spearheads the Social Enterprise Toolkit course at Impact Hub that supports aspiring entrepreneurs and innovators in developing their business dreams. So without further ado, I would like to invite Martin to help us set the context for today's webinar. So over to you, Martin. Thank you very much, Anka, and greetings, everyone. It's wonderful to be together here, reflecting, thinking about how we can enhance our capacity for innovation, particularly among uh, conservation organizations. But let me begin by asking myself the question, what is it that makes innovation imperative in our work? What is it that makes innovation as the only way to move forward for all of us as a global community. In my world, three numbers matter here. The first one is 1.8. If we were to continue our current patterns of consumption, the soon to be 9 billion human beings on planet Earth, we need at the very least 
going forward, 1.8 planets. We know extremely well how to produce the goods and services that are putting pressure on Earth's capacity to renew herself and take care of us. By the time of this meeting, I had not heard on news or anywhere else online that we have discovered how to create the other 0.8 planet we need. We can only sustain ourselves on this one planet going forward if we use innovative means to change our ways of producing goods and services. The second number that matters to me is 3.5. As you probably all know, there are 3.5 human beings on planet Earth who do not know where their next meal is going to come from. Push that number in terms of medical insurance, the number goes beyond 4 billion human beings. If we take the map of the world and mark on that map the places that are going to be hit hardest first because we are putting pressure on Earth's capacity to renew herself. And on the same map, mark where the 3.5 billion human beings on planet Earth who do not know where their next meal is going to come from are found. They map like that. And you can't create a much more potent situation for global instability than that. Everything we are seeing here is simply a symptom. If we have to solve and resolve the challenges we face, we have to know what level we are hitting at in terms of solutions. We can elect to continue as we have done over the years by simply addressing the symptoms. But we can also elect to go slightly below the surface, we begin to address what are the structures that are leading us to producing the results we want and do not want at the same time. Sometimes inquiry into the structures doesn't give us the solution. So what do we do? We go a layer deeper. We begin to address our thinking. Our thinking produces the structures, structures which are not an act of God. They are a human invention. So we have to go to the thinking that makes us define success as accumulation or success as X, Y, Z. It's the thinking. We shift the thinking. We stand a good chance of solving the critical challenges we face. But there are times when we need to go even deeper. Thinking comes from somewhere. Thinking comes from our source of identity. And that's where we ask ourselves the two questions that really matter. Who are we? And what is our work? By who are we, I do not mean an organization like Lukman Hoffman Institute or Impact Hub Lusaka or any other organization or simply the name Martin. Who are we? simply means who is the best self we can be if we were not petty as organizations as communities and as individuals and what is our work is not about a job description we ask ourselves as organizations and as individuals what is our purpose what are we here on earth for we can't be innovative to the level that the challenges I began to allude to need in order to be resolved if we are not in touch with who we are and what we are here on earth for. So it's a very deep sense of innovation. It's a very deep sense of innovation that cannot be done by a group of lone rangers. We can only do this if we learn to work through collective action. Anka, I thought I could just share those early thoughts and um, happy to uh, contribute later on. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Martin. 
And it's nice to, to see here people, so many people gathered, so many corners of this globe, giving that sense of collective spirit, collective action. And is it in that spirit of let's move underneath the surface, let's go to the deep rooted problems and let's start working with them. So the purpose of this conservation NGOs initiative and the innovation challenge is to, to surface those radical and transformative ideas that go to the root causes that Martin was just highlighting. And the questions that we have been raising in the innovation challenge are actually the things that we've heard time and time again from people that engaged in this initiative. So people like you who are present today. And we seek ideas and solutions to questions such as how might we mainstream the inclusion of different and alternative perspectives, realities, knowledge in nature and conservation work? How might we restructure, reorganize governance and operational models that have better impact on conservation, are more inclusive? How might we reimagine new models of giving or philanthropy and funding mechanism that could provide long-term sustainable financing and move away from this short-term knee-jerk reaction to the crisis situations? How might we facilitate cross-sectorial integration of biodiversity conservation of climate problems and socioeconomic issues for collective action? So let's steer away from thinking that conservation can be resolved with conservation solutions only and social economical crises need economists and things like that. No, we need to move into that space of let's work together. These are common problems across the different sectors. So we'll take a few minutes to introduce the three organizations leading this challenge that will also incubate some of the winning ideas that are will be emerging from uh, from the Innovation Challenge. And I'll start by briefly introducing the, the Kaufman Institute. So the Institute's overall, overall aim is to work and support thought leaders for a more sustainable life on Earth. So we work with principles of systems thinking, convening, co-creation to incubate, to accelerate new ideas, new appro approaches that will deliver significant gains for biodiversity. We have a small team, but we work globally and we rely on talented, passionate people from all backgrounds and geographies that are able to bring a fresh perspective on tackling world complex conservation problems. And we do this through a three-stage process that we call ideation, incubation, and acceleration. So from creating the conditions for new ideas to emerge, to provide the necessary support and work with innovators to ensure that their ideas are relevant, scalable and impactful. So this is the full spectrum of, of our work. And I would like to now invite Anayali Ramos to introduce the work of IUC and CESP. Over to you, Anne. Thank you very much, Anka, and thank you, Martin, and everyone else in this room today. It's very exciting to see the energy in the collective and all the regions represented here. Um, I'd love to hear more from everyone than, than us, so just very brief introduction to what IUCN sees, is and does. It's one of six commissions of the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And what we do, our main vision is to work toward a world where sustainability, social justice, diversity, and equity are valued in nature conservation and in development. So we're really th here to think. We're more of a little think tank and a rebel riser group within the IUCN, where we're really pushing the limits on what conservation is, what our engagement with nature is, and our human nature relationship. Specifically, I wanted to introduce our reimagined conservation work. If we could turn to the next slide, please. Um, we've, we, we launched in, in Marseille in September last year, our reimagined conservation movement. This is really a movement from the grassroots up to try and rethink and reimagine the way everyone relates to nature, not just NGOs, but as individuals, as the global south and the global north, how 
how we relate to nature and to each other. So our reimagined conservation movement has several um, arms. We're reimagining justice, reimagining leadership, reimagining funding, reimagining conservation as a whole. And we invite you all of, uh, to, to join us in this reimagine. I'll post some links in the chat for you to get more information. I'll be around for the rest of the webinar. So we invite you to listen, discuss, imagine, take action and work in the collective as Martin invited us to. Thanks very much, Anka. Thank you very much, Anayali. And now over to our colleague from Impact Hub, uh, Bruno, if you would like to, to introduce the work of Impact Hub. Sure thing. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, Impact Hub's been working for more than a decade around the world to support entrepreneurs, change makers, and innovators to start, grow, and scale resilient businesses, which will make a positive social and environmental impact. I was once myself one of those startups in London and subsequently here in Lisbon before I joined the global team as an associate. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so it, it's, um, it started as a single location in North London, and it's now become the world's largest network of entrepreneurs dedicated to improving the well-being of people and planet. Next slide, please. And today we continue to grow every year. There's about 106 hubs at the moment on five continents with more than 24,000 entrepreneurs. Some of those hubs have hundreds of members with massive international businesses in their co-working spaces. Others like us here in Lisbon, we have less than 50 members. We run a variety of programs that support local people to recover from the pandemic and overcome societal structural challenges by building ethical businesses. Uh, next, please. So between us, the global network ran over 200 programs in 2020 with more than 5,000 beneficiaries, almost half of whom attribute the success of their enterprise primarily to the Impact Hub's intervention. Um, and last slide, please. So what does that support look like? It comes in a variety of forms according to the stage, location, and market challenges of our participants. We'll be working with our partners on this program to customize the support specifically to the needs of the winners as individuals, but also as a cohort that is collectively unified in seeking solutions to these global challenges. I look forward to hearing more from all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Bruno. Um, I think it's now time to move into the details of the innovation challenge. Um, and as a reminder, please use, use the chat to ask if you have any questions as we move through this presentation. And we have a team that will select uh, the question and I will relay them to, to the speakers when we open the floor to the, for the question for the Q&A session, while at the same time, we'll try to reply in the, in the chat. So, what are we what are we looking for so during the phase one of the initiative we have identified certain structural and systemic issues that are impacting conservation work so we looked at existing power structures the legacy of discrimination gender class color the missing voices and unequal distribution of resources what are the dominant and existing narratives approaches and structures that further perpetuate social and economic inequalities. So we are looking for ideas that challenge these issues, that challenge this status quo. Ideas that are solution-driven, they are actionable, and will support ideas at any stage of development, whether they're in the ideation phase, concepts that are just emerging all the way to acceleration phase. So those that have already demonstrated proof of concept and are now ready to um, scale up and try to augment the efforts that they've already seeded. Where is actually change needed? So the structural and systemic issues impacting conservation work um, are quite broad, but we've tried to cluster them into four main themes that kept on coming up as we move through conversations with people around the world. And what I want to emphasize is that we shouldn't look at them in isolation, but they are very much interconnected. 
The challenge is seeking innovative ideas that address these themes, but I want to also highlight that we welcome those that do not neatly fall within this theme. So those that think, okay, I think there is something missing here that it's important to put forward solutions for, we welcome those as well. So I just want to briefly tell you about these four things. So power and legacy, we are looking for ideas and solutions that will help dismantle racist and discriminatory structures, rebalance the power, not only between global north and south, but also urban and rural areas. Um, move away from neo-colonial conservation approaches and address the, con the consequent disparities in the distribution of financial aid and the resources available. Moving on to the next theme, so interdependence and inclusivity. We are looking for new approaches and structures that are more collaborative and are able to engage with a wide and diverse range of conservation players. So questions around how do we operationalize uh, interconnectedness space? How do we link, better link the issues that we see in different sectors and try to address them in a collaborative manner? Communication and narratives. Um, we are really looking for ideas that will help bring together not just different narratives, but crucially different and plural voices embedded in shared knowledge, values, and vision. So I think it's important for all of us when we think about this element to try and understand what is the luggage that we bring in a room? What is our background? How do we position ourselves vis-a-vis -vis some of the, the main issues that we see in conservation? What are those those views perspectives that have actually been marginalized. Operational and funding models. Um, we are seeking here ideas that will reimagine and redesign the existing operational, financial and governance models in a way that really moves away from what I alluded a bit earlier from that linear short term um, improvements but are actually able to build on long-term sustainable financing for, for nature conservation so that we are stop continue being tied to three, five year projects and strategies. In terms of what is the, the selection criteria, so if we can move to the next slide, thank you. So the criteria are as follows. So it needs to, to contribute to the, so the ideas, all the projects that are being proposed, they need to contribute to the development of a reimagined and redesigned conservation NGO sector that is better equipped, that can better respond to social and environmental challenges. We are looking for ideas that challenge the status quo and aim to build a just, equitable, sustainable future for people and the planet. And I know that many people might have questions around what does just mean, what does equitable mean? We keep on hearing these words on and on. Um, this is something that you will see. We have a library of the definitions, so I encourage people to go and have a look there. Oftentimes you will see that Maybe these definitions are not precise, but they're just trying to provide the full spectrum of perspectives that uh, lies around them. Then it's important that these ideas are feasible and could be taken to the next le level. They are find fundable and financially sustainable and can be considered relevant or replicable in a global context. So they consider financial, technological, market or other dependencies or, or up obstacles. And we look also for ideas to bring richness and strength to collaborative processes of co-learning and incubation. So they challenge um, and uh, those are challenges and aspirations that can be effectively addressed alongside 
one of the host institutions. So either along the Kaufman Institute, IUCNSS or Impact Hub. Importantly, we welcome ideas from any sector or background. We strongly encourage uh, teams composed of people from different sectors. It's important to know that applicants do not need to have a history of working in conservation related projects or ideas or within or being part of, of NGOs. So this is a trying to really bridge that collaborative space and opening it up beyond, beyond the NGOs. And I thought it would be very useful if we could look at some very quick examples of what do we mean by that and just please treat them as a small teaser to ignite a bit your, your thinking about where this might go. So I would really like to welcome my colleague Ines to work through some of these examples with you. Over to you, Ines. Thank you very much, Anka. Um, it was really hard to pick which examples to present. There's so many exciting ideas out there. Um, just as a quick reminder, these projects are in a consolidated stage, but we're not only looking for projects that are at this level of, of, of consolidation. As Anka mentioned before, we're also looking for ideas that need to be scaled up, but they're being developed. But this, um, the idea of presenting this example is just to get our minds excited and try to think of uh, what are the, the kind of projects we're looking for. So the Ecoversities Alliance is a community of learning practitioners around the world. In response to our criteria, they are reimagining um, in general higher education um, with the big question, what might the university look like if it were at the service of our ecologies, cultures, economies, spiritualities, and life within our planetary home? Responding to our criteria, again, how is it challenging the status quo? Well, they're seeking to transform the education system by decolonize, decolonizing pedagogies and embracing the local knowledges and systems, as well as learning practices. And they have the goal of restoring and re-envisioning the learning processes that are meaningfully and relevant to the collaborative times. In a more concrete um, manner, what this community of learning practitioners are doing is regional and international gatherings, um, supporting communities, supporting uh, with the resources for germinating projects. So they're trying to create educational institutions such as um, these ones. And they're also um, working on publications, books, and et cetera. Um, next slide, please. Um, on another example, this in the interdependence and inclusivity um, theme, um, we have the Colectivo Amasijo, which is a woman-led collective that rises from the will to care, conserve, and celebrate, these in their words. Um, and what they're doing, in, in a nutshell, is they're listening to the narratives of women as they cook together with this woman, uh, the woman close to the land, the non-dominant narratives, and they're enabling ways to share, learn, and relate. They are with this redesigning conservation work uh, by creating the conditions to reflect on the origins and the diversity or biodiversity of food. They're questioning the hierarchies of knowledge and they're focusing on learning by doing. More concretely, what they're doing is they're building an archive of narratives. With these, they're measuring territorial degradation in the territories they work and they're generating indicators through narratives to measure climate change from uh, the lands of, of, of where the women in their network live and work and be. Um, so we understand that through collective cooking, we can take care of the territory, the relationships and ourselves. Um, so this is also another example uh, in the interdependence and inclusivity, but again, it's just one among a million. Um, we are going to be sharing more examples that hopefully will um, trigger inspiration and, and give more sense of what we're looking for um, exactly. Um, but, but these were just a few. Uh, could we go for, to the next slide, please? Beyond um, these concrete examples, another source of inspiration for what we're looking for can be the report that we recently, uh, that we recently launched in Exploring Possible Futures for Conservation NGOs. This report, what it does is it prospects, it imagines like innovative propositions around how conservation NGOs can fit to our possible new roles. And to do so, um, we proposed um, 15 lenses of like in a world where in certain conditions, how should the conservation NGO be? So as an example, um, on the right part of the, of the screen, in a world where um, 
where pro-conservation solutions are delivered by multiple actors, and the role of conservation NGOs is to act as a broker, a convener, enabling co-creation. Um, so we encourage you to read this report if, you, if you're seeking for inspiration, if you want to better understand what we're looking for, because this report, what it does is it imagines alternative futures for the conservation NGOs, which ultimately is what we're trying to do through this innovation challenge. Um, I'm gonna hand it back to Anka, and please don't hesitate to contact me if you want any more details on this or more inspiration. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Ines, for that. And I think, as, as Ines said, um, these are very, very few examples in, in a sea of a wide, wide spectrum of possibilities. So please don't, don't get hooked necessarily to them, but just try to use them for, for inspiration as you explore. And now moving briefly on who, who can apply. So we encourage any individual or any team from around the world. If you apply as a team, we ask you that you name three key team members in the application form and nominate a lead representative who will be the first point of, of contact. Individuals must be aged over an 18. And if teams apply, then at least one entrant entrant needs to be over 18. We have been back and forth in terms of the languages that we would welcome applications in. Um, and unfortunately, we are only able to accept application in English, but we strongly, strongly encourage both native and non-native English speakers to, to apply. And if we need support to complete the forms in English, please do reach out and we will do our best to support to support you. Moving on to the next slide. These are some of the important resources that I encourage everyone to have a quick look at. So um, what is the application portal? If you made it all the way to the webinar, then I'm sure you've already found the, the portal. Uh, you'll find there the, the form, what are the important elements of the, of the form and the contact address in case you, you have any issues or you want to submit the form. In terms of the timeline, so I think you are all aware by now that the Innovation Challenge has launched. We, it was launched on 21st of April and it will be open uh, until the 22nd of May. And then we will have a period where the applications will be reviewed by a diverse jury uh, from around the world. And, um, and the, end, the winners will be announced sometimes mid-June. Mid and we, we are looking to start the incubation programs or the co-learning programs with uh, Impact Hub, IUCN and the Luke Hoffman Institute um, from after July onwards. And more details about the, the program, so, and how the collaborative uh, program is going to function between the three um, institutions and the winners. So we are going to have up to nine winners. Each one of them is going to receive a monetary award as well as uh, gaining access to one of the partners incubation program. Um, where possible, we will try to match the um, preference of the winners to the partner organizations, but that's something that we cannot guarantee uh, for all of the applicants. And so, as I said, the collaborative program uh, and of co-learning and the incubation will start in the second half of 2022. And the length and the duration and what it entails precisely would be uh, co-developed with the winner and the host institution. Um, it is expected that 
this program would last for at least six months. I can tell you from our experience at the Kaufman Institute that um, we've had collaboration for two years, two years and, and more. So it's important to, to be aware that um, it's important to get these ideas to a stage where we feel like, okay, they're ready to fly. So the support will be there for, for long term if needed. So the host institutions will work alongside the winners to take their ideas to the next level. And as I said, it will be a co-designed process. And it's also important to mention that we are here as host organizations to learn from this process, to take some of these ideas into our organizations and to learn from inspirational individuals that are applying to this um, innovation challenge. Some of the aspects that uh, will be present throughout this program is the opportunity of uh, networking, the opportunity of offering coaching session, potential access to financial and funding support, the opportunity to form a project team within the host institution around the ideas, um, a six month membership with Impact Hub, um, and uh, those ideas that are incubated through, through Impact Hub. So I think um, I will stop there. I hope that this uh, short presentation was useful. I see that we are already getting some questions in the chat box. But before we, we move on to the question and answer, I would really like to invite Martin back again to conclude with a few inspiring words just as he as he started. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anka and colleagues who have earlier on uh, spoken, uh, Bruno, uh, Ame Amelia, and and just the opportunity to begin to dream together or continue to dream together. As I said earlier on, when we look at the challenges we are confronted by, we have no choice but to reach out, reach out to one another. And hence, this challenge encourages collaboration. Because it's when you are coming from one source of an idea and I'm coming from another and in the next person. And as we come together, some new sparks emerge. Maybe the value is not even on the price as in money. The real value in my view lies in the networks that will be deepened, that will be developed. In the part of Africa I come from, which is Zambia, and also Southern Africa in general, we have a saying that is now commonplace in the world. If we are driven by the philosophy of Ubuntu, I am because you are, we begin to tap into a different form of intelligence. The usual, possibly mostly Western driven approach to knowing and intelligence doesn't look like it is sufficient to get us to the next level we want to be. When my colleagues and I began to revisit the notion of Ubuntu, I began to learn that in the statement, I am because you are, you are does not simply refer to you as another human being. I am because you are includes the following. It includes the ancestors, those that have gone before us. And unless we really learn to stand on their shoulders, we don't stand a good chance of creating a different future. But you are also refers to mother nature. Unless mother nature is well, 
we cannot be well. And I learned that in the statement, my well-being is intertwined with your well-being, includes those who will call us their ancestors, the future generations. Why am I yapping about that? The usual mindset of just looking in this way to ourselves is not sufficient to, cre to, to create the innovation we are looking for. It's in this spirit that I'm encouraging you, I'm encouraging ourselves to wear a very different form of knowing. In my other heart, in the Presencing Institute community, we refer to at least three forms of intelligence. The intelligence of the open mind, when we are dealing with unlimited possibilities and permutations, not to be narrowed by one truth. We talk about the intelligence of the open heart, that that which is on the left side of our chest is not just a blood pumping machine. Before Cartesian thinking took over, I think, therefore, I am. Almost all traditional wisdoms across the world knew that the heart is a place of thought and knowing. But in the end, there is the intelligence of the open will. Unless we can have the courage to experiment, to prototype, to try out things in action, we can't pave new ways. And I hope. This challenge invites us to tap into the three faculties of knowing, three faculties of intelligence, our open mind, open heart, and open will. Thank you. Martin, thank you so much for those inspiring words. And what better way to say I am because you are and keep that at the forefront of our mind. And I think one, one thing that stuck with me as we move through, through this initiative has been that we heard a lot of people questioning who has more legitimacy, who has more relevance to start a process like this. Is this yet again maybe a Western-led type of initiative? And it came to me one day that it doesn't matter. We all need to be co-agitators. We all need to bring that past with us. We all need to understand what is our positionality. We all need to work on this collectively. What we need to steer away from is polarizing an already over extra mega polarized space and try to find ways to, to work together. It's not easy, but the invitation is open to everyone who wants to make a contribution to think of the person that sits next to them, to think of the person that might sit countries away from them and understand that it's about each and one of us and it's about all of us. So thank you, Martin, for just bringing that back to, to us and grounding us um, in, in this beautiful quote. So with that, I really want to thank the, the panelists. I want to thank the people that have stayed with us so far. And we are now uh, ready to open the, the floor for uh, the Q&A. So, very happy i see that there are a lot of uh, questions already in the in the chat box and as we filter through them i would like to start by asking anyone who wants to jump in and raise their hand to ask a question to to the panel and uh, let's let's start by doing that and i will also pick up some of the questions in the chat box but if anyone would like to start please raise your hand and uh, use the, the function in Zoom, and we'll be very happy to hear your voice. I see that we already have Matteo. Please let us know what is the question you'd like to have answered. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Matteo Ndu, and I'm in Senegal. So my question was, what is your 
program or your vision for African countries. Because in Africa, people destroy the resources of Africa. And what is, what are your, your, your projects for the destroy for the, for the of African resources? Like uh, fish uh, in the sea and other resources on the, in the, in the land, for the, fish, the sea and the land, because Africa is victim of many destroy of, of its uh, resources. Or since two years, Two years ago, I am fighting for the, for the destroy of this process, the resources of uh, Africa. That is your Thank you. Thank you for that, Mathieu. So Mathieu has joined us from Senegal. I couldn't hear you very well, but what I gathered was that you're asking or acknowledging that there are so many problems and concerns that the African continent is facing. So what might be some of the vision solutions put forward? And it's an open question. This is the reason why we are here. It's a question that we are, I can basically put back to you. And it's something that we invite everyone to have a think and think, what are the deep rooted issues that you see? in the work that you are doing, in the collaborations that we are, you are having. Please surface that and think, do I have an idea to put forward? Do I see somewhere else an example that I think would benefit the issues that I'm seeing here? Could I start working with them, collaborate, think about putting these ideas forward and bring them to the innovation challenge so that we can work with them and say, yes, it's something that we can augment, it's something that we can scale, it's something that we can, we can explore. So my encouragement is maybe to take some of Martin's wise words, is to try to go beyond the surface and try to understand how many layers deeper do I have to go until I identify what is the source of the problem and how should we start working with it. I hope that starts answering a bit your, your question. Yeah, thank you for that, Mike. Do we have any further questions that people, yes. Uh, I see that we already have someone else uh, from Safe Path Alliance. Yes, please go ahead if you can tell us the name where you're joining and what the, the question is. Hello, I'm Miles Zulu uh, from Zambia. Um, what I think, uh, uh, being a person who has been working uh, in Africa and in my country as Zambia, I feel that um, unless we bridge the gap, the gap of involving the people on the ground, because they are the ones that are facing these problems every day, the bottom up approach will be the only way to solve these problems. Um, we are facing different problems in our different localities. But what I've seen and my experience is that these people, they know their problems and uh, they have some of the solutions. But the problem that these people have is the capacity. The capacity to address these issues, especially that uh, we are moving towards um, you know, some changes. They may be doing things in a traditional way, but somehow they have the knowledge. So what we need is uh, to bring their traditional knowledge together with science and uh, try to find the solution. If we did that, I can assure you that we are going to see some changes and some results. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for that, Zuru. And if I understood correctly, you joined us from Gambia. Just wanted to give uh, the chance to Amayali Ramos. Maybe she would like to, to respond to that. How do we relate uh, to this gap that we are seeing from the local communities, the bottom-up approaches, the uh, engagement with traditional knowledge and, and science and yeah. Yes, Anka, thank you very much. I would love to respond. And Rose, I think you renamed Rose. I would love to hear more about what you think is the solution. We work across a lot of landscapes and regions in the world on trying to support collective grassroots approaches from the bottom up, and none of them look the same. So in some of the communities we work in, the type of support they need or the way that they're engaging with NGOs at different regional levels is quite different from others. So more than anything, I think for us, this innovation challenge provides the opportunity to really understand the diversity of support that is needed and the diversity and creativity of approaches. So I think just going in line with what Martin was saying earlier about us having a collective approach. And I think in this collective approach, having a diverse approach is also key. So more than anything from listening to you, I would just like to understand more, to learn more, to hear more from you about the type of support and approaches that you are seeking or the type of creative solutions that have worked in your region with your community or in your context. Um, and I think that's what the Innovation Challenge provides the opportunity to do, is to really understand and listen from each other and engage with each other to understand better and further support the types of grassroots initiatives and the types of traditional knowledge and how and why um, we can support that. So I know a very vague response, but it's mostly just an invitation to engage more, Rose. Thank you for that. Uh... Ameyali, I think if I'm not mistaken, I think it was Zuru who raised the question. I'm not sure, Rose, you wanted to ask a question as well. We, we can't see, so I'm not sure if the name was changed. Oh, my apologies then. I, I saw, I misread the name of the participant. That's, that's all right. I think, um, it was Zulu, and I, I hope Zulu uh, has got an answer. My name is Rose. Um, I'm actually based in Kenya, Nairobi. I have a question, and it's a, it's basically, I've said it on the chat box as well. Is there a, a way of being able to send in um, a draft idea just to check whether it's actually viable for this um, competition? And the reason I ask that is because in the cluster of communication, it's sometimes not very tangible in terms of uh, exactly what the idea is. Some of them are usually one-off. So I want to know whether you have, a within the process of checking for the uh, competition, whether there's a way for us to send in for a check where you're told whether it's viable or not. And that, so that we don't actually kind of like, how do you say, send in lots of things that may not be viable and then we, we put so much time into it. Over. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Rose. So... It's something that we we haven't considered. Um, I think I strongly encourage people to be confident and comfortable and explore as much as possible some of the unturned stones and corners. And I think because the spectrum of the topics is so broad and because there are so many issues that this innovation challenge is trying to you know, address, I feel that it will be very difficult not to find a place where this idea could come to life and be a seed of something inspirational. And maybe one important aspect to, to mention is have a look a bit through our definition to try to understand what do we mean by transformation? What do we mean by innovation? What does radical mean? Because you will also find that it's not about reinventing the wheel always. Many of the solutions that we've seen in conservation reside outside of NGOs, yeah? We have indigenous traditional communities that have sustained biodiversity in structures that are completely different to how we've seen 
the NGO structure is being developed, constructed, and working. And those structures have been there for decades, hundreds of years. And they might not be innovation per se, but there is innovation in trying to mainstream some of these structures that we are seeing, yeah, and proposing new ways of looking at them. So innovation is quite a really broad spectrum and try to keep an open mind about it and don't think that the innovation comes, as I said, trying to reinvent things, but it's just bringing processes, looking at things from different perspectives, facets, and trying to bring those to the table to inspire us how we can think better about the approaches in, in conservation. Does that answer your question, Rose? Yes, it does, and thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you, Rose. So I'm happy to take one of the questions in the chat box. So I see that Yolandi uh, Showman said that this is a really excellent initiative. Would it be possible in the future to also create a networking platform between participants and the greater conservation community? So thinking about how do we open the space to maintain this momentum to make sure that there is cross seeding, cross pollination, that we continue to to learn from this, that we continue to really push the boundaries and move move the needle for these efforts. And the answer is that it's something we we are thinking about. It's something that I think it will be critical moving into into the next stage. Uh, one of the areas that we are working on is creating a library of all these ideas that are coming from everyone, making it making them available to organizations at large that have been part of this initiative and individuals that have similar, maybe similar um, interests. Maybe they have they see similar approaches and try to connect that network. How we are going to do that precisely, we are yet to explore, but it's on, on, our, on our table. And I think part of it is that we invite people to put ideas forward. We invite people to sustain some of these communities. As you've seen, there are so many themes that we need to work on. And I think it will be important to acknowledge that at one point these communities will have to start working on more targeted areas but at the same time allow that breathing experience between the different communities to come together to share these aspects considering that many of the topics are so intimately interlinked okay I see that we also have another hand raised. Um, if I pronounce this correctly, Neki, would you like to, to tell us what is the question you'd like to raise? Thank you. I think my question is just about, you know, um, how this gets, whatever ideas that eventually get approved by your institute uh, gets sustained over time. You know, because why I say this is that um, as a women's rights organizations working with communities, sometimes, you know, you start off a project with them. And one of the concerns we were, we've always had with, you know, women in our communities is, you know, raising their hopes about, you know, being able to change their lives. You know, change takes time. And, you know, you're able to start off a project, but you're not really able to perhaps sustain it to a point where they can on their own take it up. So I just wanted to know whether um, with this particular uh, process, there may likely be opportunities for uh, the proposals or the ideas that, that make it to the final stage to get uh, sustained over maybe a certain period of time, you know, to also help you know, the communities where those ideas may be tested out or tried because um, that's one of the concerns we've always had, you know, when it comes to the work we do in communities, where you, you start something and, you know, there's this tendency for 
for quick action or quick turnover of results. And you'll find that the idea doesn't really go down well with the women because their hopes are there and they don't really have time to really work the process with you to, to, to yield the fruit and for them to be happy with what is happening. So I'm just asking about how long this is likely to happen and whether there are opportunities of this being scaled up or sustained after this first cycle. Wonderful, thank you very much for that, Nikki. So I would like to maybe ask Amayali if she wants to respond to this and I'm also happy to, to add to, to this from the Kaufman Institute side and also maybe Bruno, you would like to, to add something from Impact Hub as well. Yes, thank you, Anka. I think the, the, the question you raised there about the long-term support, I think is essential. I think that's one of the biggest challenges that has been raised in conservation has been that a lot of the support given is usually very project specific and project based and not long-term. So there is no building of a trust-based relationship there. Um, we fully agree the limitations and are aware of the limitations of this innovation challenge. This being a very, very small seed funding available to grow and, and think through what would be required for it to have a more of a long-term impact or a longer relationship. It's our hope that through the incubation period, at least through IUCN CISP, that we will work with those who have been selected to try and put you in touch with possible funders for long-term support, with funder funding initiatives for long-term support, with networking initiatives that could maybe not provide the financial support, but definitely the networking support you need to take that project into a more of a long-term spectrum. But definitely aware that this innovation challenge is not intended to be a solution. It's more of some seed money that can help you think through the next steps and what is needed and help you through the incubation period, get in touch with those who can support in a more long-term sustainable way. Wonderful. Thank yeah, you. I would, um, I was, yeah, and Ketchi, I think you actually described one of the biggest challenges that we're trying to address with this challenge. So what we're really looking for is revenue models or financial sustainability models. This always go, also goes to someone who asked in the chat about what does financial sustainability mean? It comes in many, many different forms and we're looking for creative, innovative descriptions or uh, imaginations of what a financially sustainable NGO sector or NGO project might look like precisely to address the type of challenges that you describe so eloquently. Um, so, uh, Yes, we, we share the concern and we, we hope that people can help us articulate problems, uh, solutions. Wonderful, thank you for that, Bruno. And uh, Martin, would you also like to, to add something to that? Um, yes, uh, um, Kechi, it's, it's an important question you raise. I'm speaking in very general terms here rather than specific to uh, the core for uh, this challenge. In my view, an opportunity such as the one we are discussing here uh, consists or works best if parties involved are radically open that this is a small seed that is going to hopefully germinate and take somewhere else. We do not have anything more or we have something more radical openness in a journey like this is critical. Number two, it is also important to know, in my view, the value of this is the creation of a community with whom you can think about new possibilities together. The networks that will emerge in the process of doing this are more valuable and they create the kind of and defined sustainability that we might be looking for. So radical openness about what is possible from the start, what is on offer so that nobody is duped. Number two, to see this in terms of the building of quality relationships and then possibilities become unlimited that way. Wonderful, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Martin. Ketchi, I hope that you, you got the question answered. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> wonderful, thank you. I, I see that um, we have also zero again. I just want to 
raise one of the questions in, in the chat box briefly, and then we can take your, your question in a, in a moment. So I see that there was a question linked to the theme of narratives. If we have any examples that we can share, one that is long running and has created change. And I would like to invite my colleague, Ines, if she would like to say a couple more words on that. Thank you, Anka. So um, in terms of an example of a project or program that is in the long run and has created change um, for narratives, um, I think um, UN, UNHCR, um, humanitarian example, Project Unsung, um, is recent, is ongoing in this direction and can be a good example. Um, but hopefully we'll be also updating our libraries of examples um, to have more inspiration in this direction. So please, again, I encourage you to um, visit the webpage, uh, the application portal often and, and visit this library constantly. Thank you, Ines. Um, Zulu, would you like to raise your question now? Um, it was not a question. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add to maybe to yeah add to the question that uh Ketch had asked about the sustainability i think uh, as an organization that has worked with the people on the ground uh sustainability comes when uh the communities um feel that uh, they are the owners of the same project so you walk with you walk with them, just as I said at first, that uh, uh, you need to get on the ground and understand what they are doing and what they love most. I'll give you one example of the project that we've been running. It's beekeeping. Beekeeping, we have been supporting beekeeping and uh, the communities have been doing it on traditional uh, bases where they will remove the back of the tree and then, uh, yeah, they will uh, do the beekeeping. But removing the back of the tree is one part which is a bad one because when they remove the back of the tree, then there will be uh, no water that will be, you know, transmitted or transported to the tree and finally the tree will get dry. But because of that, then you, you go with the new technology that you use the beehives, then you give them, then you do the training, then you provide them with maybe protecting clothing because them when they are going there traditionally, either they wear a sack and that sack sometimes they do suffocate. So when you do that, you find that already they were doing that and they have interest. So in doing that, you find that this project has will go on. It has been going on. You provide them with a, a um, processing machine and then you train them in packaging. You link them to the market. And then uh, you, you also make sure that uh, you train them in the, what maybe it's marketing analysis and development, where you just teach them simple mathematics on, uh, on, uh, on, on knowing to, uh, you know, to have records and also to have a cash flow. By doing that, we have seen our project that has been going on and on and on, and they no longer come to us, but they also even put in themselves when they feel that there's uh, uh, somewhere where they need to, uh, put in so that their business can continue. So I just wanted to share our experience on how we have done with our uh, uh, sustainability part. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Sulu. I was just wondering if from the panelists, Martin, Name, Bruno, do you have anything that you would like to add, respond to that? I know it's not a question per se, but I think it's a valuable insight. No, I guess I would just reiterate that you're right. I think sustainability, especially when you're working on a project that requires so many steps and a link to the to the 
to the market or, or value chain, for instance, is very complicated and sustainability, rethinking and reimagining what sustainability means in that context is part of what we're trying to do, is rethinking how we engage with communities, reimagining re um, the type of support that's needed, reimagining that it's not just about conservation, it's about value supply chains, it's about the market, it's about gender, it's about empowerment. And so I think these ideas are really, really important. And, and I'm really glad you've raised them in the context of here of reimagining what these conservation NGOs and how they operate to help us rethink that it goes beyond just the conservation of the bees or the produ production of that specific product, but all of the steps it entails and all of the work and all of the expectations that are raised in the process. So that's all I would, I would comment on that, Anka. And uh, my comment, um, Miles, is just to further be in agreement with you. Um, our arrogance as uh, big institutions, our arrogance as the so-called traveled and educated, sometimes has killed the innovations that are already existing at the local level and quite often what is working at the local level has elements of sustainability in it but we come in with our perception disrupt what is working instead of having the humility to sit down and learn and be work from what you are calling the bottom up maybe as anka said the innovation is not dreaming of something completely new my less the innovation in your case might be can we look at what is working already among our people, but find a way of playing the grand game? How can we scale up what is going on there? Maybe with a little bit of learning from other places, but the backbone of that which will be scaled up comes from the base, comes from the local communities. What stands in the way more often than not is the arrogance of big institutions, big organizations, and the so-called learned. Thank you for that, Martin. Thank you for that, Ame. Um, I thought it would be a good opportunity. I saw that we have with us in the room, the Radwan, who has worked on an initiative that we've been closely monitoring, working with, engaging with called uh, Ringo, Reimagining International NGOs. And I would really like to invite Deborah because they've been through a similar process to us to share some of the, the learnings, just to give you a bit of a flavor of how this type of ideas emerge and how they can be brought to, to life. So Deborah, sorry to put you on the spot, it will be great to to hear some of the of the learnings you have for for this group of people. Sorry, Anka, when you said "Can I call you?" I thought you meant after this call. I didn't think you meant in the webinar because I have prepared nothing. I just will say that you know we started the Ringo project started about um, nice to see you, Martin, as well. Started about um, a year and a half ago, roughly. First lab members gathered about a, a year ago. And we did a slightly different process of ideation. We did it, you know, why is the system stuck? We went through a whole process to understand why the system is stuck. And then we went into ideation phase with the lab. We only went out afterwards once we sourced ideas from within the lab. So it was a slightly different process. However, there are some really interesting similarities and some um, exciting opportunities. And um, I do think people have found the networking really helpful and that you know it's all kindred spirits. We also have an issue around how do we sustain prototypes, though our model is slightly different than yours. But um, so we're actually trialing out new funding models. Um, so I, I guess the, the what we encouraged people in applying for prototypes was now they most of them came from within the lab, so they've been part of the lab itself for about a year. But we encourage people to. Um, really be ambitious and think outside the box and don't let all the, oh, what ifs, oh, I don't think this will work, oh, that will get, don't let that get in the way. The prototyping process is, as, as one of my colleagues framed it today, a learning process in itself. You know, you do a little bit, 
you learn, you come back, you learn some more, you refine. And we have this habit in, in civil society of projectizing and always looking to the end game and saying, you know, what are our log frames and our outcomes? And this is for us is a whole new way of working and thinking in an innovation space. Um, we, I think funders themselves are quite open to funding innovation and people who are willing to trial it out. And I think they're open to the doing and not the thinking. So I definitely think there's a lot of people who would be open if you, you know, you just get the idea going and refined a bit to looking at how to fund it more sustainably over time. And I mentioned in the chat one thing that we are trialing out, which is, you know, so this is, we do have some conservation NGOs involved in our work actually, but it's actually local civil society groups coming together and saying, actually, this is how we wanna work in solidarity. And then they're gonna go out to the INGOs and do a call for proposals and say, okay, what are you gonna give us? And that's something once they've tried that out, we think it, you know, we'll see how it works. We can feed back to this group. And I'm sure, you know, many of the prototypes here could possibly adopt those sorts of methods. But, you know, in some, my lesson is it's challenging. Language is a challenge. We are doing some language prototypes actually that will help people get over the English domination. I won't tell you about those just yet, but uh, within about two months, we might have the ability for people to communicate in their own language um, using AI is just to be open, creative and experimental and not afraid to have some crazy ideas because those are usually the most interesting. That's all in the short space of time without anything prepared. <laughs> no, fantastic. Thank you for that, Deborah. And thank you for, for yeah, allowing yourself to be put on the, on the spot. And I think one, one important element that Deborah highlighted is this trial and error and embarking on, we know it's a risky path, but we know that we need to keep pushing the boundaries. And we are in that space of thinking not everything that will be put on the table will succeed, but we need to keep on, on trying. And an important aspect of this is that us as organizations, we are here to learn and we are here to make mistakes. And I don't think it's important to see that we create this space, this community for things to start emerging and, you know, at one point becoming self-sustainable. We are just part of a moment in, in time and understand that is not us to ultimately make the final decision, but is us as a community to learn through, through this process. So we are very much open to any positive or critical aspects that you want to put on the table. Could we improve stuff? Could we do things better? Are we blindsided by certain aspects? This still remains and it will be a dynamic and not stagnant conversation that will, will evolve and we've seen as Ami Ali said earlier about the Reimagining Conservation Initiative that they started, it's continuing to be a deep conversation and deep learning process and is not going to emerge, you know, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, but it's going to be a transformative process that will take a period of time. And we need to be open to embrace that space. We need to be able to embrace that failures that might come along the, the journey. So thank you, Deborah, for reminding us that, you know, we'll be there in that space of let's try, we'll fail, but we'll learn and we'll move forward. And it's very important that people like Deborah and the similar initiatives that are out there that we connect these spaces together. We take the learnings that they're having, and I'm very happy to hear that you might be overcoming that language barrier because it's been something that we really reflected a lot on. And it will be very, very interesting to see, you know, in the next iterations in this process, how can we use and make use of the prototypes that are emerging there, as well as share the ones that are emerging through this innovation challenge. And I know we are getting very close towards the, the end of the session. So just wanted to welcome from the panelists, if they have any further and last concluding remarks, reflections, any inspiring words for everyone who, who stayed with us till, till the end. 
and then we'll briefly close the session. If I may, thank you. I'll just take that opportunity to say, yeah, I very much endorse um, what Deborah said about thinking big. And um, my suggestion to people writing, if you're trying to think about how to make the best application, one of the most important things is to demonstrate an understanding of the problem that you're trying to solve, to be really clear about the issues that um, are structural and need to be overcome with evidence, and to demonstrate that you uh, might not know exactly what the solutions are, but you can start to imagine them. So even if you're only at the stage of having an idea or only at the stage of having a discussion, if you can paint a convincing narrative of what the future might look like, imagining a possible future, then that's, the, then that's amazing. You might not have very many business skills or fundraising skills or communication skills. That's what we're here to help you with. But if you have the creativity and the deep understanding of the challenges that a particular community or the global community is facing, then, uh, and you have a convincing and charismatic vision of the potential future, then that's something that we can get behind and we can mobilize resources to support you. So don't be scared to dream big. And we look forward to reading your applications. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Bruno. Ame, Martin, any final words of wisdom? I guess from IUCNC, just to say we're very excited. We're very excited not just to hear your ideas and your suggestions, but to be on this journey with you to reimagine ourselves and our place in the world as IUCNC, as an individual myself. So very excited to be on this journey with all of you and excited to with about the opportunity of working with you in the coming months. Thank you, Ame. My closing remarks can only uh, re-echo what Deborah said. If there is one big lesson that those of us that work in international, local, national, non-governmental institutions, the one thing we need to enhance in learning is the spirit of learning through experimentation. All the matrices we use ask us to be sure of the results and guarantee them. And yet when we see everything we admire around us, it didn't come, out, come from where people were completely sure. They suspected, they had a hunch. Then they began to explore through try and error. It's a skill and quality. Those of us that are working in this field and in the development sector in general, need to enhance. Learn by doing. Try and error in the end leads us to the innovation we are looking for. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. And with those inspirational words, I uh, encourage everyone to embark on this journey, be bold, take a leap of faith, uh, impress us, impress yourself with uh, the corner of your imaginations and We've been through this many times through this process of tri trials and errors, but let's let's keep keep that game going because we we definitely need it. And I know that you are here with us today because you feel the need that things need to be changed. So let's work on this together. And I I'm personally I'm super super excited to be going through the applications that we'll uh, we'll have in the coming months. So. Thank you once again, everyone, for your time. Um, the recording of this webinar will be uploaded onto the Luke Hoffman Institute webpage. We will also update the FAQ with some of the questions that were raised. And if we've missed some of them, please feel free to reach to us uh, directly on the Future NGO uh, email address. And Bon chance, good luck, everyone, and really, really looking forward to, to reading these ideas. And thank you once again to our panelists and for the inspiring words that we've been hearing and to the amazing team that brought us here together. Good luck, everyone, and I look forward to having you as part of this journey moving forward. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Obrigada. Obrigada.